presents an inspiring gospel reflection by Father Michael Sparrow. Father Michael is a Jesuit priest working as a writer and retreat master at the Bellarmine Jesuit Retreat House outside Chicago. The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Luke. At that time, John summoned two of his disciples and sent them to the Lord to ask, Are you the one who is to come, or should we look for another? When the men came to the Lord, they said, John the Baptist has sent us to you to ask, Are you the one who is to come, or should we look for another? At that time, Jesus cured many of their diseases, sufferings, and evil spirits. He also granted sight to many who were blind. And Jesus said to them in reply, Go and tell John what you have seen and heard. The blind regain their sight. The lame walk. Lepers are cleansed. The deaf hear. The dead are raised. The poor have the good news proclaimed to them. And blessed is the one who takes no offense in me. The Gospel of the Lord. Lord. Expectations. We all have them. It's practically impossible not to have expectations of what is going to come. The spiritual discipline is holding those expectations loosely so that God can surprise us. From that perspective, Advent is a time of preparation for allowing God to surprise us, to come into our lives in unexpected ways. Certainly the people of Israel were longing for a Messiah. The prophets had been predicting this for centuries. Every young Jewish boy and girl would be schooled in those prophetic honor utterances and hoping for the Messiah to come. But they had different expectations of what that, ex of what that Messiah would look like. The most common expectation is that he would be a military soldier, a great king like David, that he would lead the people in battle and expel the Romans, and once again they would be free, and once again their nation would be united. No longer two kingdoms, but one, controlling their own destiny. John the Baptist arrives on the scene, and when they ask him, who are you? He quotes Isaiah chapter 40. He says, I'm the voice of one crying in the desert. Make straight the way of the Lord. The winding ways will be made straight and the rough roads made smooth. The valleys will be filled in and the mountains leveled. He quotes Isaiah chapter 40 to explain what his mission is in preparing the way of the Lord. And John, Jesus says of him, there's nobody born of woman greater than John the Baptist. He's a major figure on the scene. And he's obviously a prophet. He lives an ascetic life. And the tax collectors and the sinners and all kinds of people go out to the desert to receive his baptism of repentance. And John has a sense, he has an expectation of what the Messiah is going to be like. He said, he will gather the wheat into his barn, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. Translation, if you're a sinner, you better watch out because there's going to be hell to pay. So repent now. Participate in this baptism. John is this great, charismatic, prophetic figure. 
But then he gets arrested by King Herod because he stands up. He speaks truth to power. He stands up to Herod. He says, you're in an unlawful marriage. Herod throws him in the clink. John's whole ministry has been about prepare the way of the Lord. The Messiah is coming. And when Jesus appears on the scene, he says, behold, the Lamb of God. I must grow less. He must grow greater. Don't follow me. Follow him. And yet Jesus isn't gathering an army. Jesus isn't preaching fiery repentance. If you don't shape up, you're going to go to hell. That isn't Jesus' message. And John knows that his time is growing short. It's sooner or later, the axe is going to fall on him. And in my reading of this text, there's a bit of a crisis of faith for John the Baptist. Now, we heard this, basically this same gospel last Sunday. There we heard Matthew's version, chapter 11. Today we hear Luke's version of the same story from Luke chapter 7. Slight differences, but it's basically the same text, same story. So if you missed it on Sunday, the church says, let's come back and look at it again. You get a second time. Holy repetition. What are, your ex what are our expectations? Because the expectation of John was not what Jesus was, what Jesus was about, what Jesus was proclaiming. So there's this crisis of faith in John, and he sends his disciples to Jesus and says, did I get it wrong? Are you the one who is to come? I felt the power of the Holy Spirit. I pointed you. I sent my disciples to you. I said, I must grow less. He must grow greater but you're not doing what I expected you to do. And Jesus sends back his response. John began his ministry by quoting the prophet Isaiah, chapter 40. Jesus goes five chapters earlier and quotes Isaiah 35. If you missed it, here was the text on Sunday. Then the eyes of the blind will be opened, the ears of the deaf be cleared. Then will the lame leap like a stag. Then the tongue of the mute will sing. John par Jesus paraphrases that and says, go back to John and tell him what you've seen and heard. The fulfillment of this prophecy. The blind regain their sight, the lame walk, lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the poor have the good news proclaimed to them. And then the kicker. Blessed are those who find no scandal in me. In other words, John, can you let go of your expectations and allow God to do something new? I'm not coming, pointing the finger at the sinners, sinners and saying, repent or you're going to hell. I'm proclaiming mercy, compassion, reaching out to those who are brokenhearted, to those who have lost hope. I'm gathering them in and saying, the largesse of God's mercy is infinite. Turn to God and receive that forgiveness. John, blessed are you if you can believe that and not be scandalized. Because you got so many things right, John, but you missed this crucial aspect of the message that the heart of God is mercy. That's what I've come to proclaim. We are a divided nation, are we not? We are a divided church, are we not? We are a divided household. And for most of us, we say things would be just so much better. We could get along if you'd only see things the way that I see it. Can't you, can't you understand that I have it right? 
Jesus says, pray that our eyes might be open, that we can see with different eyes. This past week at Bellarmine, we had a recovery retreat, a 12-step retreat. We call them the Bill W. retreats after the founder of 12 Steps. We had like 60 alcoholics coming. And I find those among the most inspiring retreats at Bellarmine. When I listen to the men and the women tell their stories, because what all of those stories hold in common is there's a point in their life where they hit the bottom, the addiction is destroying their life, sometimes destroying their marriage, destroying their health, destroying their career. They hit a wall and there's a point of surrender, of saying, I can't do this. But I believe that a power greater than myself can restore me to sanity. I got to put my life in God's hands and say, God, I need your help. I need your mercy. I can't do it myself. That is so inspiring to hear people come in and say, I know I need God. I just can't do it by myself. Sometimes I think I get it right. And then I recognize I got to come back and just beg for God's mercy and God's help. And I do it one day at a time. It's the only way I can maintain my sobriety and my serenity. One day at a time, asking for the grace that I need. I find that so inspiring. Because there's an openness to recognizing our need for God. What only God can give. God turning our mind around, God freeing us from distorted thinking, from stinking thinking, as it's sometimes called. As many of you know, I have an annual tradition of writing a Christmas poem. A number of years ago, I was reflecting on these themes. And Jesus coming, as the new man, as the new Adam, and Mother Mary coming into our life as the new Eve, the one who calls us to a rebirth, a rebirth of hope. This journey of Advent is a preparation for the birth of Jesus. It's a preparation for new hope coming into our life. It's a preparation for allowing God's kingdom to break into our lives our new Adam and Eve. When faith falters, virtue fails, and deeds of love are few, then, holy child, I pray that we may always turn in hope to you. You, our new Adam, your mother, our new Eve, this hope to which you beckon us, far beyond what we conceive. So why are we disheartened when those whom we appoint reveal themselves as only human and inevitably disappoint? May we hope not in our strength, wisdom, goodness, or our reason, not in our economy, technology, nor the latest, greatest of a season, Turn our eyes to you, O little one, whose beauty ever ancient, ever new, births hope not of our making, but from you, through you, in you. May we embrace your living words, anchoring hope amidst the strife. I've come to be born in every heart, that you may have new life. Amen? Amen. Amen. Heart to heart, hand in hand, praying for grace to understand. Spirit of Jesus, open.